for so many reasons, uh, Temple Emmanuel is just the most wonderful community garden of generosity and kindness. And one way that is expressed is, is how uh, our temple uh, takes care of their rabbis. And um, I am especially grateful that this congregation, um, that every three years, uh, in addition to you know, my usual vacation time, I'm granted two extra weeks uh, as sabbatical leave uh, to pursue a study, personal development, professional development. And this is in fact one such summer and I've already spent one week and I have yet another week uh, coming up. So we're having a happy reunion tonight and then I'm leaving again on Tuesday. But, but I will be back. That's the whole point of the sabbatical, that they come back. Um, and uh, part of the goal of the sabbatical, though, is that it's not just for me, that um, with me comes the whole congregation, and as I engage in my learning and my studies and reading, that I would be bringing back um, the wisdom of our uh, generations and our heritage or the brightest new scholarship um, to us here at Temple. And, and this year, I believe will be especially fruitful for the congregation because, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that I'm doing, um, because so many congregations have gone online during the pandemic and, and keep the recordings on their YouTube pages, so I'm able to attend services from all over, which normally I'm busy on Friday night. Uh, and now I've been attending services and it's been really insightful. Um, but I'll another time to discuss that. I'm also taking classes, recorded classes from all over, but most especially from the Hebrew Union College. During the pandemic, they recognized as their teachers were teaching online that the teachers are now, these professors are now capable of teaching, you know, online via Zoom. And so they started recording lectures by their professors and now have created this archive that's a tremendous resource. The Hubert College is the reform movement's uh, seminary and professional education institution for cantors and educators, and, uh, and obviously for rabbis, uh, where I was ordained and your other rabbis. And it, the faculty is second to none, and now it's accessible to all of us, including me on my laptop, wherever I am. And tonight, I thought I would begin the process of bringing home some of the learning. And I want to share with you, not one lecture, but one piece of one lecture that so far I, uh, has been among the ones that I have found most fascinating. And here I did you a favor because I'm not going to share with you any of the duds. <laughs> and. Um, and it's interesting, so far I haven't had any duds from the faculty. The school also puts together these panels where they bring in experts in various fields. And I found those almost all have been meh, and the faculty ones have been great. I'm like, mm, good HUC on that part. So this is one, um, was a lecture from uh, one of the faculty members from Los Angeles. So we never would have had this opportunity to study with him until you know this came about. His name is. Uh, Dr. Joshua Hollow. Um, he is a professor of history with a specialization in medieval uh, Jewish history. And the lecture was specifically about one very specific topic, which is the redemption of captives, of captive hostages in 11th and 12th century uh, Mediterranean coastal cities. Perfect, because tonight's theme, by the way, our dinner is a Mediterranean dinner. Um, but that is coincidental. I'm not that good. The, the topic is, what did the Jewish communities do when Jews who were traveling by ship across the Mediterranean were taken captive by pirates and held hostage for, you know, a uh, dollar, well, not dollar, but you know what I mean, a monetary <laughs> ransom. Uh, what was the response of the Jewish community? So, the HUC billed it as Jews of the high seas. 
but that was a really misleading title because this was not swashbuckler piracy Jews, which there were, but that's a very different era. That's the Caribbean centuries, four or 500 years later. We are talking 11th and 12th century where Jews were passengers on ships and were taken captive, as were others, in a very different era of piracy. So to understand this a little bit, we have to understand what was piracy like uh, at this time? Because frankly, it's so otherworldly fascinating and different from what we know in our world today. So piracy in that era was not like the Caribbean pirates who were scofflaws and outlaws and running from you know, the law and the government and the navies who were trying to, you know, to kill them and put them down. No, quite the opposite. Uh, the Mediterranean in the 11th and 12th century was occupied by a whole series of basically city-state nations, coastal city-states, all along the Mediterranean, North Africa and Southern Europe. And each one was relatively independent, and each one had their big port. And in that big port, there was an industry of pirates who were of the people who, you know, who lived in that city. And, uh, you know, they would go out into the Mediterranean and just like fishermen would, except instead of catching fish, they were capturing vessels and bringing them back to the port. And they would sell what they had or ransom the ship to the ship's owner. And if there were people, passengers on board, they would you know, imprison them until those people's people came and paid to get them released. And it was industry. There was a set fee for every person. It wasn't if you're important or not person. Everybody, it was a certain fee. And the, the, the local police, the, the local government didn't mind because these were our boys going out and getting, you know, uh, and bringing money and it was taxed and they were part of the community. And to the people they were capturing were other people, you know, like, and not our problem, right? Um, and they were bringing money to our, you know, to our so they were of the community, these pirates. Um, and if you got captured, it was just, oh, bummer. You know, like it was not like your country was going to come save you. It was like, now we've got to pay. Um, that was the norm in this era. Now, what this particular professor was doing is he was examining letters that were written between Jewish communities in various parts of the Mediterranean, because this is what would happen. A pirate of, let's say you lived in uh, Alexandria, you know, coastal Egypt. You live, you know, you, you're, you're a Jew in coastal Alexandria, your local pirate goes out, they get a ship, you know, they come back in and they come and tell you, they say, Rivka, um, we got two Jews. Uh, you're going to redeem them? And Rivka's like, you know I will. Let me go talk to my people. Rivka goes to you know, the, Jew, the, the gathering of the, you know, the Jewish elders, they all get together, they pull together the money, and they go redeem these two Jews that happened, you know, they were trying to go from Spain to Turkey, and boom, they got, you know, they got nabbed, and now they're in Alexandria, Egypt, and the Jews there, you know, pay for them. But the Jews of Alexandria, they don't want to fit this, foot this bill, so what do they do? They write to the hometown of these Jews and said, we just released, you know, your two Jews. It cost blank. Send us the money. I mean, these are your Jews. This is, you know, your responsibility. They put it on the community of origin. And then that community of origin goes, well, that's a little much. We wouldn't have, you know, and then these letters go back and forth. And then that community of origin sends the money to Alexandria. And then that community of origin goes to that, their families and like, you know, we just put up for your relatives and now they're collecting money. And all of these are documented in letters. And some of these letters got put in the Cairo Geniza, thank goodness, which means they got preserved in an arid, perfect temperature climate um, that uh, saved them for a, a, a almost a thousand years before you know the scholars discovered it about a hundred years ago and now we can you know read these letters um, and some other sources too but primarily the Cairo Geniza is where and so he's reading these letters and examining these letters 
and extrapolating about the commerce, uh, not only the piracy, but also the interrelations between the Jewish communities. And everything about this is fascinating. I'll just throw, I guess, two tidbits. One, what language were the letters written in? So the Jew in Alexandria speaks Arabic. They're writing to Jews in Italy, their Turkey, Greece, Spain, who speak Greek and Spanish or Ladino and Proto-Italian Latin. I don't know what they were speaking in Italy a thousand years ago, but Jews were speaking that. So they spoke, the letters were written in their shared language, which is Hebrew. And it's a little bit of a myth buster. So all of us proper Zionists know that one of the great miracles of Zionism and, and uh, um, uh, 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 what was his name, the, the, the Ben Yehuda, uh, you know, who wrote the first dictionary and so forth, was that they recreated a spoken Hebrew language that hadn't been spoken for, you know, for 2,000 years. It was holy language, but it wasn't spoken. It turns out that's not 100% true. It was not the spoken language for 2,000 years of the, of the street, of the, of the regular commerce that people, it wasn't anyone's first language on the street. But when Jews of one place had to communicate with Jews of another place, they spoke Hebrew because it was their shared language. So you have this whole mini but literature of spoken commerce Hebrew that exists only in letters in between um, communities. I mean, I guess they could have had phone calls, but they didn't have a phone. So it exists in letters um, between different Jewish communities writing in Hebrew, which is interesting. And now comes the big one. So the scholar Joshua Hollow says, one of the things that's so extraordinary about this whole enterprise, this network of Jews collecting these ransoms from the other communities is this. There's no corollary in the Gentile community. So, we know that the Talmud teaches, Kol Yisrael Aravim Zebazeh, all of Israel, every person of the people of Israel is responsible for one another. It's a, it's a value, it's an inherent um, maxim of our people that we are all responsible for each other. Well, that's words. The question is, when push comes to shove, do Jews do it? And in the 11th and the 12th century Mediterranean, they did in ways that no one else did. So this is what would happen when a pirate took a ship. They'd go take a ship, there'd be cargo on it, they'd sell it or ransom it to the owner, and then there'd be 30 passengers on it. And the passengers come, bum, 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 and they'd throw them all in the stock, you know, in their little prison setup that they had, waiting to be redeemed. And the passengers are from here, there, and everywhere of different ilk. They would have to meticulously go and contact the communities of origin of these people. And they couldn't even just, if someone was from Spain, they couldn't just contact Spain. They'd be like, oh, they're, they're from you know, Valencia. I, I don't even know them. So they, the pirates would have to contact Valencia. And the Valencia would be like, oh, they, they prayed the other church. And, you know, and then they would have to go to the exact church community that the people prayed in. And the pirates had to track down someone to redeem the, each person. And so the people would languish for months in this prison, stockade, whatever it was. And except Jews, the pirates didn't try to seek their community of origin. They just went to find the local Jews and said, I've got two Jews, I got six Jews. I've got a mother and a daughter, I've got a, you know, a father and a son, I've got two brothers, are you gonna redeem them and the Jews would? They didn't have to track down any, they just found any Jew, the Jew would redeem them, 
and then the, that would be, and then it was the Jews' problem to to get try to get their money back. And what we find is that the Jews paid. And when they didn't have the money, there was one case, a letter. This one is from the Cairo Museum, Geniza, where there was an enormous, uh, there was a lot of Jews, and the, the Jewish community didn't have the funds to pay the ransom right away, and didn't want them languishing in this prison. One of the leaders of the community, who was known by the pirates, respected as a you know a you know an honorable man about town, he said, "Put me in. We're good for the money. I take me as the hostage. Lease them." So think about what he did. He released hostages from somewhere else that he's never met, and put himself in prison with the expectation that the Jewish community is going to pay to release him. That was the trust that Jews in one, had in one another in the 11th and the 12th century Mediterranean. And what we learn is that the words of the Talmud, which were written 600 years before, 800 years before, not sure, that they weren't just words. It was the value of the people. And when I learned this, I was just overcome with such an enormous sense of pride. But then that pride really gave way immediately to just appreciation. Because I felt it. I know when I went off to college, there were people in the town where I went who just sort of looked after the Jews in the, you know, my little college. I know that when I've traveled about, that I've had invitations um, to Shabbat dinners and seders. I, know, I felt it. I know it's not just then. It's not just from the Talmud. It's not just from medieval times. It's one of the things that I just love most about being Jewish. And what this little bit of scholarship showed me is that it's not just like a personal experience of my life, but it's actually just a core essential value of the Jewish people of every age. And it's not just a lovely Shabbat dinner, but when lives are on the line, that someone will step in and self-sacrifice on behalf of Jews that they've never even met before because Kol Yisrael Aravim Zebatze, it says in the Talmud, and in fact, every Jew is responsible for one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.